Well, it was a time when no one felt safe, a whole town on edge. Decades later, the same community is fighting furiously to keep the notorious serial killer who terrorised them locked up. Straight through. Straight through. One of Australia's most twisted murderers. You made that yourself? Yeah. There was just this sense of absolute disbelief that this could happen right under their noses. He could just sail in and take a woman off the streets. Tonight, in his first television interview, Baby Jake, 12 days old, when his mum was killed. To this day, I still sort of ask myself why it happened. And the cops who cracked the case. A cold, callous killer that will never change. United to keep serial killer Paul Denya behind bars. 30 years ago, Frankston, on the outskirts of Melbourne, was paralysed by terror. Three young women murdered at random. After his arrest, Paul Denya gloated about his urge to kill. You can only imagine the panic then, that within weeks, he could be back roaming these streets as Denya makes an application for parole. It makes me really fearful for the whole community if he were to be paroled. A Friday night in June 1993, high school student Elizabeth Stevens jumps off a bus on her way home. She's about to become Denya's first victim. In these police interviews, he describes his crimes in extraordinary detail. Much of it is still too graphic to broadcast. Stabbed her three or four times. A month on, 21-year-old Denya tries it again on Rosa Toth, but she escapes. An hour later, he strikes again. Saw her jump out of the car. Yes. Ran into the milk bar here. Right. It's the last time Debbie Freeham's seen alive. It's a hole through my life. It was, it's what's missing that matters the most. Jake Blair was the baby who became the unwilling face of Denya's terror, too tiny to understand. Just ring the police. It's, it's not just a mother, it's not just a caretaker, it's not just a guardian. It was a life of opportunity. Now left with a lifetime to wonder. For most of his childhood, Jake thought his mum had left until his dad told him the truth. It was a weird day, it got very quiet by the end of the day sort of thing. There was not much talking going on. We sort of just separated ourselves within the house and, you know, he obviously just let me, let it sink in with him. The whole town is hard to describe. It was like, it's like they were in lockdown, really. David Limbrick, now a Victorian MP, was 19 when he was dating Year 12 student Natalie Russell. I'd spoken to Natalie about it specifically because I was terrified and so, you know, she promised me that she wouldn't walk around by herself at night. I think that's probably why she came home early. And I went through this hole and waited behind the trees there right. until I saw her walk past here and heading that way. She was just a really hilarious, bright, happy, clever girl. Um, that's where I start to get a bit choked up. <laughs> Karen was Natalie's best friend. And it's a real jolt still to just go, she's not here anymore, do you know? As much as I'm a much older woman now and, you know, had my, my full life, there's still a part that never really went past where that stopped. In the four hours of denials of the interview... Former homicide detective Charlie Bazina worked hard to put Denya behind bars. And then come the, the break, the admission, Denya loved the attention while leading police through the streets of Frankston and his flat, showing off his homemade weapons. It's in the ceiling up there. Into the ceiling up there. And they're like, another one's gone missing. Crime writer Vicky Petratus has just released a podcast on Denya. She was covering the story at the time. He targeted people close to home. That's where it started. His first victim of the first break-in and trashing of their place was, was a woman he lived next door to. 
Paul Denier was given three life sentences without parole because of the danger he posed to society. But he appealed and convinced the court that after 30 years, he should be given a chance at freedom. Clearly the government's chosen to put their faith in the parole process. Our role now is to um, make our voices heard so that hopefully the parole board will see and listen to the concern from the community. Yeah, I can sort of feel the fear, I guess you'd say, from other people as well as myself, and it's just, it just builds and builds. Do you think he could kill again? Absolutely. There is no doubt in my mind. He is programmed that way.